Excellent. There we are. We're recording. All right. Hello and welcome to the National Road Safety Partnership Program webinar, Road Rage and Aggressive Driving. Um, my name is Jerome Carslake and I'm the Program Director of the NRSVP and its many activities. Uh, to find out more, please visit the NRSVP website, read your our newsletter, um, or even better, follow us on social media as well, especially our LinkedIn page, and you'll see a lot more activities and bits and pieces that go along. Um, today's session is going to go for approximately 60 minutes. Um, there's going to be plenty of time throughout for discussion. Um, we're recording it, and it will be provided to everyone afterwards, and it'll be linked back to the NRSP website, as will the, uh, the PowerPoint as well. So you'll get a follow-up email in about uh, 24 hours afterwards. Um, we like to hit, make these uh, webinars as interactive as possible. So please send through your questions uh, by typing them into the question box. Um, there's a chat box as well for free to comment and throw some thoughts around, but please use the question box um, to pose them to go out there. Uh, we can then record it and follow up afterwards. Um, should we run out of any time as well as we've got a good record of them as well. Um, okay. We'll flow through nicely. And Amanda said, Look, let's just make this as interactive as possible as we go along. So I mentioned Amanda a few times. Um, Amanda, welcome on board. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jerome. I'm really looking forward to this. So have I. It's been, uh, Amanda's helped me sort of bed in nicely since we came across to Monash University Accident Research Centre. It's been fantastic. Um, part of the background to her, she's been involved in road safety research for the past 15 years, studying in psychology. Um, behind the driver behaviour. So she's worked in a field at a leading institution in England, Scotland and the Republic of Ireland. Um, and Amanda's co-authored a number of 80 peer-reviewed articles, conference papers and industry reports. Um, and she's recognised as an expert in aggressive driving. And also over the last sort of few months, uh, NRHP and MUARC have actually gone through building a whole campaign, organisational campaign with Budget Direct as well. Uh, and we're drawing it together. So it's been an awesome experience. I've really enjoyed working with Amanda and all the different sort of people that have helped collaboratively put this together. So let's dive on into Amanda. Fantastic. Okay. And, and Jerome, I've also really enjoyed working with you on this campaign as well. And um, just to sort of reiterate what Jerome said, this is something I'm quite passionate about, anger and aggression. Um, so I can tend to lose myself in just talking about it. So <laughs> please do jump in any questions and try to make it as interactive as possible. Um, I thought what I would do is, is sort of present it across three sections. One, sort of talk about why aggression matters. And that's something that has really underlined our campaign pain um, to sort of uh, show why it's not worth worth the risk at all. Um, to sort of discuss the triggers for anger and aggression, I think everyone has their own triggers, but I can sort of present some research, uh, research sort of showing it on a more global, um, global level, and then lead into what we can do about it, which is really talking about the campaign um, and, and, and show, highlighting some of the things that have come out of the campaign. So... So let's go. So the first thing I wanted to do was actually pose the question to you uh, to, to sort of take, take a few seconds. When I say, what is aggressive driving? What sort of situations do you picture? And I think, I think for most of us, we'd think about those extreme road rage events, you know, where you hear about just a, a minor thing has happened on the road and it's escalated to the point where somebody's got out of their car and they've physically tried to or they've actually hurt someone. Uh, and these are, we see these as being relatively common. Uh, they're often in the media and they're definitely um, all over social media as well. Uh, and, and to prepare this presentation, I had a quick look and some of these examples I've popped up uh, are just happened in the past couple of weeks. So you probably noticed this as well, Jerome, that, that you know, we often see this feeding through in our media feeds. We don't actually know whether these are um, more, more common now or we're just able to capture them more because we have the dash cam footage. But what's really good about having this dash cam footage is it keeps us in the conversation about aggressive driving uh, and about aggressive driving as a safety risk. And is it, they're all males here, is it more prevalent than males or are we just a bit hotter headed or do women get involved in this as well? We do, we do see, uh, I think the example I had up, uh, one was about a woman, but the research that we've seen, particularly when we're looking at the more extreme aggression, such as that road rage, is it does tend to be more males uh, than females. Interestingly, um, if you ask males and females how angry they get when driving, uh, if we do tend to find gender differences, females report getting angrier, uh, but the males definitely tend to exhibit this aggressively. 
So that's uh, it's, it's quite neat. So internal age more in the in the women. They sort of just internalise and just yeah. Yeah, yeah. As with women, yeah, they'll often say they get more angry, but yeah, it's the men who um, who might express this aggressively, and, that, and there's a whole a bunch of reasons for that too. So, and we see that feeding through um, a, a whole different types of aggression. So, the road rage incidents, the the ones that I showed uh, just before, that forms only a really small part of of what is aggressive driving. And I think the prevalence shows it's about two to four percent of drivers will say they've engaged in in road rage or this sort of physical assault or attempted physical assault. What, what we sort of focus more on, I'm going to talk more about today, is the more common but uh, less e extreme behaviours. And I sort of conceptualise these in two ways. We have the minor aggressions. So when you get angry and you honk the horn or you gesticulate a little bit. Um, and then we have the aggressive violations. So when you, you express your anger using the car, so you might follow a car a bit too closely or speed off or tailgating. And these are quite quite common, Jerome. If you have a look, up to eighty percent of drivers will will say at some point they've you know exhibited their anger um, in a minor using minor aggression. Up to fifty percent at some point will get a, a little bit angry and, and speed or tailgate off. So these are, these are more common. But the, it, what the philosophy is that other people or is that me? Is, is that everyone? Is, is that everyone else's fault or is that my fault? Uh, for, for the aggression yeah. um, most of the time it's everyone else's fault <laughs> and, and it gets to the point where you get so so angry uh, and frustrated that you, you sort of exhibit it using the vehicle and you feel that you want to and and something that's really um that minister has obvious safety uh, safety repercussions, and I'll talk about that uh, in the next slide. But something that Jerome, you and I have talked a fair bit about on this campaign as well is the fact that these aggressions can have um, both short and longer term impacts just on your general well being. Um, so I don't know for, for most people watching. I don't know yourself, Jerome, if you've ever experienced someone being aggressive towards you, and if you think about that. Um, how did it make you feel and whether you still have that feeling now? Can you still sort of, and has it actually affected how you drive on the road? Uh, they, they, they pop into my mind straight away. There's a couple and um, fortunately, I think uh, I reflect back to time in Perth. I think when I was a, a P plater and you do just probably make a few stupid mistakes here and there, P plate out there and um, cut someone off when two things were merging, uh, just driven down from the country. So I was still in country mode, unfortunately, and made a little bit of a, um, and someone got rifle, got out and kicked the car window um, and all this sort of stuff. We were just two cars didn't quite merge that well. And the guy went nuts at me. <laughs> I remember that well and truly as one of the early driving experiences. And I think I think that's it. Even even the more minor uh, aggression, uh, even having someone honk their horn or yell at you, sometimes these can can stay in your memory a lot longer than the incident itself, and it can shape your behaviour down the track. And we see this a lot, particularly with drivers who tend to be a little bit anxious. Uh, if you we're doing a fair bit of research at the moment into anxious driving and and a lot of the concerns that anxious drivers have are about these negative interactions with other drivers so even the minor aggressions uh, they're critiques of driving behavior that, that can make someone quite anxious on the road but but also the the vehicle aggression being tailgated and having someone drive quite dangerously and aggressively towards you can be enough for some drivers to actually avoid driving um, either specific specific roads or specific times, but also avoid driving completely. So that can have knock-on effects as well um, in terms of mobility if you don't have uh, different transport options uh, and longer-term effects too. That's a really interesting point because I reflect on um, some of the companies when they put the telematics devices in their vehicles and they have speed limiters in there and they might travel exactly at the speed limit. And I've heard narratives from some of these companies when their workers are out there and they're subject in regional areas and they're going at exactly the speed limit or they might have had a geofence and they're a little bit slower. Um, and then what happens is uh, they're subject to rage or anger or, or this sort of stuff and they pull into a service station, the workers cop all this abuse purely for going at the speed limit in a country area. And they're like, man, you could be going so much quicker. And, they, and it's this, this conundrum the company's got to deal with. They get this anger for local areas, but they go, well, this is, what's, this is a duty of care and safety for our workers. 
Yeah, yeah, indeed. It's really tricky. And that makes it harder as well because for a lot of us, we, we have the ability to avoid driving on certain roads or certain times, um, whereas I guess for other people, uh, that we don't have that option. So it, it does make it a lot harder, harder to deal with. And that's exactly what... Um, uh, as part of this campaign, that budget direct survey um, that you gov ran for them showed that about 43% of drivers would um, or have changed their route or their times to avoid aggressive driving behaviour. So even if it doesn't lead to anxiety, it's definitely affecting the travel patterns of people for who it can um, have the option of changing. Indeed. So something, Jerome, I also wanted to, to bring up, um, and it's really stuck in my head since uh, you said this <laughs> many months ago, uh, driving is how you start and end your day. And, and I thought that is just such a, a, a nice way to look at it. And for many of us, our, our normal is uh, driving is a battlefield. We get in it, it's, it's heavy, it's aggressive, um, and, and it can sort of affect us uh, as we get out. And there's a lot of research uh, showing that these events aren't siloed. So, you know, if we, if we sort of start our day before we get in the car and we're, we're really angry or we're frustrated or we're stressed, we don't leave these stresses behind. They come in the car with us. So, you know, as we're, we're angry or we're stressed, we're more likely to then be angry or aggressive drivers. Um, but equally, if, if we have sort of angry or ag aggressive experiences while we're driving, then when we get to work or we get home, we're more likely to be with our work or our family so it creates this kind of um, reciprocal cycle and we find that I've found that as well if you're sort of in and out of the car during the day if you have one one drive it's just, just full of tension and anger then that's going to affect your subsequent drive as well so these these definitely aren't siloed and as you say Jerome this is often how we start and how we end our day and so the experiences we have on the road can then transfer into how we are at work and how we are at home I think that's a great point. Um, I think we'll be exploring this a little bit coming on, but Lindy's got a question here. Do you consider someone deliberately flashing their lights as a minor or aggressive violation? Um, it, that, can, that can really vary. Um, it depends also in what context, but I would almost say that could be a minor aggression. Um, mm. and that's interesting because the other part, I was just reflecting on some work when we were doing the headspace and I was talking to an organisation, to a fellow, and we spoke around this whole risk of emotions and how you start and finish the day and aggression. And this guy went to me and he goes, look, I had the crappiest Friday. I got out, I was so angry. I had a bad day. I got in the car and he goes, do you know how good it felt to do a broggy as I backed out? And I was squeezing the, the steering wheel. And, was, and he reflected on himself about this comment, how he said how aggression and can make you drive more more violent, uh, can increase your risk. And he just centered himself, took a few breaths, and he goes, hang on, my work week's finished. I'm leaving the crap behind. What am I doing here getting angry about this? Let's go enjoy my weekend. And he changed his whole mindset. So I'm looking forward to talking about that as we go through. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. Um, so the next thing I'll touch upon is, is the safety risk that we have, because I think this is quite important, particularly uh, underlying our campaign, uh, that, that, that it's not worth the risk here. Uh, so, so some really nice, um, nice uh, data from a study in America. I've, I've done the graphics as Australian specific, but this is actually uh, data from the US, and they are able to link the car telematics data with videos of inside and outside the car. So they can actually see what, what happened, what's happening immediately before a crash and calculate crash risk based on that. And so when we look at the speeding or aggressive driving, and, and these behaviours would include what I, I sort of defined as aggressive violations. So you're tailgating, you're weaving in and out of traffic, um, you're aggressive speeding. You can see that your crash risk when you're doing these behaviours compared to when you're driving I guess, safely, for want of a better word, um, increases your crash by about 11 fold. So, so you, you, it's a significant risk when you are being aggressive. Um, simply getting in the car or being angry when you're in the car, visibly angry, um, also increases your risk tenfold, um, which is kind of interesting. But, but a point I really like about this, Jerome, is where this sits with the other road safety risks that we know of. So uh, how comparable is aggressive driving to say distraction or fatigue when we look at risk? So using the same study here, 
you can see that distraction now they've, they've they're sort of in this study they merged a lot of different distractions um, so they had quite a wide uh, range of distracting activities but that uh, doubled your crash risk uh, and fatigue, it was threefold uh, for your crash risk. So if you look at uh, aggressive driving and, and speeding, it's four, it's uh, 11 times compared to say two or three times. So it's significantly, um, it, it poses a significantly higher risk. Now, if you look at the prevalence of that as well, so they were able to sort of look at these videos and see how often people were engaging in these. In about 4% of cases, people were being aggressive. Um, and when you compare that to about 2% of fatigue. So it, it was more prevalent than say sort of fatigue that we would see. Distraction, because there were so many uh, different behaviours in distraction, that was quite common. And that's probably why the risk seems quite low. That risk would be a little bit higher if you broke down the different types of, of distraction. But, but nonetheless, you can really see that aggressive driving is, is up there in terms of the safety risk that it poses. But it does, and, and that's what, going back to that fellow, like, when he said to himself, you just see like getting in the car and the emotion, the wheel, I can really release my anger into the vehicle and I can, I can actually translate it into an activity to try and lighten my load and take it out in the world. But, and ironically, that person driving, doing that sort of action would become a distraction for other drivers as well, going, look at that guy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and as we're going to touch upon in a minute... Yeah. It's a cycle again, isn't it? Because seeing somebody drive dangerously or driving aggressively is actually a trigger um, for our own anger as well. So, so it can encourage anger in us. Um, and it comes along the line. So, so I guess... Um, I guess the, the next thing I, I would pose, and I'm not going to ask anybody to actually own up to that, but to have a think about whether you yourself would think you're an aggressive driver. And, and again, Jerome, just to sort of uh, bring it back to the survey that Budget directed um, as had commissioned as part of this, uh, this campaign, they, they asked people and 18% of respondents said that they would see themselves an aggressive driver. So 2% uh, said they would uh, always be an aggressive driver and the other had it less frequent. What's particularly interesting, uh, I find in this, is this doesn't marry up to the prevalence statistics I presented earlier, where we say that, well, look, you know, up to 80% of us um, might engage in minor aggression or up to 50% of us have at some time, um, you know, used our vehicle to express, uh, express our emotions. Uh, and I think this is particularly important because it means that we don't have to see ourselves as an aggressive person or see ourselves as an aggressive driver to actually have days where we express our anger aggressively on the roads. So up, up, to, up to half of, of, of drivers may have a, a situation or a bunch of circumstances that come together that means at one time they're on the road, they're angry and they react aggressively. And it doesn't mean they're aggressive people and it doesn't mean that they're aggressive drivers. And I think that's, that's one of the really important points in this area. And it's something that we've done um, a fair bit of work on and we're looking at, uh, my colleagues and I are doing a behaviour change program at the moment to help reduce aggressive driving. And this idea underlines that change, that, that change program. Um, it, it's about something that happens on the day and your reaction to that. We don't get in the car and we don't set out to be aggressive and dangerous. Um, but, but circumstances lead us to points where we, at that point, engage in that behaviour. And just to emphasise that, I wanted to share um, a scenario that was designed as part of this behaviour change program, because I think it's a, it's a really nice uh, scenario. So I'm just going to share that now. So imagine that you've been up all night and you're waiting to... Um, uh, you've got a big meeting in the morning or a big webinar and you have to get there on time before it's going to start. But you sleep in because you've been up late. Um, so now you're running really late and you've got a really long drive ahead of you and a deadline that you can't move. So you're naturally really quite stressed. But because you're late, you've now found yourself stuck in really hard traffic and you're wondering what you're going to do and how you're going to get there and another car cuts in front of you. So you're already stressed, you're already a little bit frustrated and then this happens. And how is it going to make you feel? Um, it's probably going to lead to a little bit more anger. Then you find that the car that cut in front of you is driving slower than the other traffic in front of you. What are you going to do? 
And in some situations, some people are going to drive a little bit closer to that car and tailgate. It doesn't mean that every time they get on the road, they're jumping and they're tailgating and they're being aggressive. But that day under that situation, they decided to tailgate because they were angry. And in doing that, as you mentioned before, Jerome, it's increasing their crash risk. So I think that's a really, really nice example of how we can have situations that, um, that occur and that sort of anger us and we react accordingly at the time. We don't set out to do it. And most of the drivers who are aggressive towards us probably didn't set out to be aggressive, um, but, but there's a combination of circumstances that leads to that. Do, do you see a compounding as well? Like, because you said like you get 80, like, over time, is there a risk if you got if you're getting more and more angry regularly behind the wheel? Can you sort of escalate up and escalate up? Is there a pattern of, of aggression like that? I think that's a really neat point. Um, and in terms of uh, definitely within a drive, you can see how uh, anger can exacerbate over time and 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 throughout the drive. And you can see it if you're angry when you get in the car then you're probably more likely to be angry when you're driving. Um, so, so it sort of does compound. But what's particularly interesting about anger is that um, unlike anger in other situations where it, it sort of compounds more slowly, you can get in the car in a happy state and still end up getting out quite angry. Um, and there's not a lot of other contexts that, that you would have that sort of quick rise, no. um, as quick of a rise. So, and I think that fits in really nicely with this um, uh, this idea about inner driving demon. And before we go, I've got a great question here from <laughs> Rosalie. I've got a great question from Rosalie, I thought, which is a great one, just to, which will feed in nicely. And so Rosalie asks, do you see road rage as a form of mental instability that really needs to be addressed earlier rather than never? So it sort of builds on, I guess, to what I said earlier, but what's your thoughts on that? Uh, if you're talking about the absolute extreme uh, levels of road rage, um, yes, that's that's not um, most drivers wouldn't sort of get to that level, and there probably are different characteristics of people who would get to to that extreme level. I definitely think aggressive driving is something that we we could be focusing on uh, early on in our training. Uh, you know, learning not to be as reactive, to sort of not uh, focus so much on the stereotypes that we have or our sort of existing driving schemas um, and, and almost not accepting it as, as part of our driving culture like we do. Um, you know, for most of us, we get in the car and we know that, you know, we're going to have a, an hour's commute to work or an hour's drive to, to a meeting um, and we're sort of almost expecting that, you know, oh, traffic's going to be bad, people are going to be angry. <laughs> so That's awesome. So our anger... Our inner demon, let's explore that, shall we? Absolutely. Uh, and, and it's a concept that, that, that's come up during our campaign very much. And I think it, um, it, it describes really nicely this idea. And, and I wonder if, if Jerome, you, you have this, if you know anyone who you would say, oh, you know, they're, the, they're the, the happiest, friendliest person I know, but oh, yeah, get them behind the wheel and they just, you know. They, they, they transform. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I know I, I, I know a few people like that and I'm sure a lot of other people do too. And, and there's actually a reason for that. It's because the, the anger that we experience while driving is different to the anger that we experience anywhere else. Um, and, and one of my favourite stories uh, was by um, one of the leading researchers in the area of driving anger, Professor Jerry Deffenbacher. And in, in the early 90s, he was a um, clinical psychologist and he was really interested in creating a program to help uh, people who had uh, problems with anger. Uh, and so to, to sort of form the evidence base for this program, he asked 1,600 college students to keep a diary and write down any, any time that they got angry to describe the experiences of that anger, the context the anger happened in and sort of the level and intensity of it. And, and he was saying to us almost unanimously in these 1600 diaries that were kept for two weeks, everybody said driving was a specific context that they got angry in. And not only that, but how anger manifested and the, the, the strength of the anger 
was unique to driving, completely different to when anger was talked about in other contexts. And, and I love this story because it was a pivotal moment for, for Professor Deffenbacher because he, he then sort of started exploring this and spent 30 years exploring driving anger um, and designing scales to measure driving anger and, and, and um, focusing on, on what we can do about it. So, so since that time, uh, other researchers have also looked at anger uh, in the driving context and compared that to outside of the, the driving context. And to sort of take a, take a step back, what makes us angry, or what, normally the situations that make us angry is when we've got a clear goal or an aim and we feel that um, somebody's got in the way of that and they didn't have to. So, so it's when there's someone to blame for what we see as deliberately getting in the way of us achieving what we want to achieve. Uh, but that's more prominent in the driving situation. And what people have found is that it's easier for us to blame other drivers for our driving circumstance. And as I was saying earlier, Jerome, our, our, our anger is less intertwined with other emotions. So we can get in the car perfectly happy um, and end up quite angry. But, but equally, when we get in the car and we're sort of angry or stressed, we're also slightly more likely to blame other people for our situation. So it's a bit of a cycle there. And, and as Professor Deffenbacher found and, and other researchers have subsequently explored, that we experience more anger in these driving situations than we do in, in other contexts as well. And so a huge part of this is because when we're driving, there's less opportunity to communicate with other drivers. So, so it's easier for us to misconstrue the behaviour of another driver. They may not be intentionally being aggressive towards us or have intentionally cut us off. They may have just made a mistake, but it's harder for us to, to pick up that cue. And we're all... So easier to act aggressively. I wouldn't um, stand in a supermarket queue and tut or gesticulate if someone sort of cut in front of me. Well, not um, not, not pre lockdown anyway. But but you know, in in the road, it's a lot easier to do. So and, and I think another problem we have, or why anger is so easy at the road, is because we have to think really quickly. It's a high risk dynamic situation. So sometimes we don't have the time or the cognitive resources to really examine the driving situation to try to get an in-depth idea of why this has happened. So we rely more on um, our existing ideas or our stereotypes in a way. And it, all of that makes it easier for us to blame others for what's happening and to get more angry. Is it all, do you think like, when we drive a car, it's all that fight flight thing in, in our brain and because we're stuck in the car and we can't really run away from where we're going to go, that we just go straight to fight mode we, and whether it's a mumbling and depending how it is. Is that a knee-jerk reaction? Yeah, it can be. And a lot of it comes down to um, how much we think that our behaviour will change the situation. So, so if we sort of in a situation where, you know, something's triggered our anger, but we think, oh, but if I tailgate that, that driver, they'll move out of the way. Or if I sort of quickly uh, go past them, you know, I'll be able to to get back on the road to achieving my goal. So a lot of it is tied into how we expect the outcome to go and whether the outcome is going to favour favor our goal or what we're looking for. Wow. Well, um, the question here, a little bit, uh, sort of drawing on something which, which uh, who was it? Uh, I think it was, Ro yeah, Rosalie just sort of asked on this one here. Um, and I was just reflecting on it as well. Can you, can you identify any triggering behaviours or psychological elements? So if you're an employer or something, are there any areas or personalities which might be of a risk for someone coming in or you just need to be aware of so you can sort of safely manage them as well? Uh, for, for driving anger or aggression? Yeah. The more extreme, extreme aggression, yeah. Is there any sort of triggers or things you can actually identify to say, look, that, that someone might be susceptible, so I just need some more training or some, some material that can support them? Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. And there's a lot of research that has looked at, um, I mean, we, we even have scales, and I'm going to discuss one in, in a few moments as well, to measure people's propensity to become angry on the road, and also their propensity to become aggressive. It doesn't mean that they're always going to be angry or aggressive, but it can give you a really good indication of um, whether somebody uh, would tend to, to react in that, in that way. And so you could even use those scales to really understand what areas can we perhaps help, help people in um, if you tend to be 
sort of um, use your vehicle aggressively when you get angry. Well, let's look at what gets you angry and we've got scales to measure that. And then sort of let's talk about how we can um, deal with that in other ways. And, and part of the campaign as well, Jerome is awesome because it gets people thinking about that in a different, different mindset. So we have specific driving scales you can use to measure that as well as other sort of personality measures too. And I'll reflect back on another conversation I had with um, an organisation. Uh, this, this GM said, look, they give out awards for the most improved driver and employee and all this sort of stuff. And there's one guy, um, he shared a story. He said, they had this, this uh, employee who sat there and he was actually just about to get sacked. And he was on his second warning from extreme driving and all this sort of stuff. And he was told you have to go on a two-day two day, um, training course and this other sort of elements. And then he went, left work where he got the notification. He was doing this, picked up his wife, got home with her. His wife got out of the car and just in, and went to him just in case she didn't realise everyone else is in the effing driving is on the road. You're the consistent person in there. Me and the kids are banned from going in the car with you until you sort your act out. He went, hmm. Drove into work the next day, did the training and actually sat and listened. And then what he learned from that was he went, hmm. And the end result was 12 months later, he got an award for most improved employee and all this other stuff. And he shared this story with the GM and he says, that point in how I drive my aggression, he goes, I actually realized, like what we're talking about, and he says, it's, it's his time. His demon was getting out and it's flowing into work. It's flying into the home. And he went, geez, it wasn't worth it. Um, and he just recentered himself and actually went, look, everyone else isn't trying to beat me off the lights. It's not, it's not a race. It doesn't matter. And it sort of shifted his whole thinking. Yeah, exactly. And and sometimes that's that's the, the best uh, tool you have at your disposal. I mean, we can't change the behaviour of other drivers sometimes. Um, you know, if, if you are, you know, like the example you gave earlier, Jerome, if if you, you know, you, you have a certain speed limit that you have to drive at and it might even be under the, the, the standard speed limit, you can't sometimes behavior of the drivers around you what you can change is how you react to that um and and this idea that we've got embedded within the campaign that travel time is your time let's protect this and let's keep this as your time and not let it ruin your day i think is really powerful and sometimes um the, the option that you have and, and that's where like tim makes a comment here not only to start and end the day but a significant part of a person's life uh, he calculated the 15 years he'd spent on the road he'd spent one year of his life commuting in the traffic that's awesome. Are there any yeah? Are there any stats on the time people spend in this significantly stressful environment as well? Well, I think Jerome, part of the one of the posters uh, for our campaign. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I know it's going to come up soon. Uh, I think um, we actually uh, list how long people can spend driving, uh, and I think the you know the average driver spends what is it you know drives about 13 and a half thousand kilometers a, a, a year and that's that's before you take into account you know professional drivers and people are on the road a lot so i i, I love that i love that stat that it, it's a year of your life and how do you want to spend that do you want to be angry or do you want to enjoy it and what are you going to do are you going to be happy <laughs> I, I, I think that's yeah yeah i tell you i want to i want to hear a good podcast <laughs> <So I'm laughs> <laughs> <laughs> so so um the, going back to to the question about how we can sort of understand if people have tendencies to be angry or aggressive we developed a scale a couple of years ago um uh, the measure for angry drivers scale uh, and it was building on the work that jerry deffenbacher did back in back in 1994 when he realized that driving anger uh, was a problem he developed a scale to to measure one's tendency to become angry while driving and that scale uh, has been really widely used but as you can imagine that was done in 1994 so so driving's changed um uh, and it was designed on um, American college students as well. So we, we wanted to design a, a more contemporary scale to, to measure driving in Australia um, in the current driving climate that we have. And so we started with about 200 items that we pulled from all places that might potentially make drivers angry. Um, and we, we sort of ended up statistically whittling it down to 23 items that represent three broad types of um, situations. And I'm sure most people watching these will resonate um, a danger posed by others. Uh, so it's, it's particularly situations where the behavior of another driver forces you to react in some ways you have to brake or you have to to swerve 
um, aggression from other drivers is also a key uh, trigger of anger. And what's particularly interesting about this is it's the mainly inappropriate behaviors, aggression that's seen as inappropriate. So when someone honks the horn for no reason or someone acts aggressively. And, and as I mentioned earlier, Jerome, this I find particularly interesting because if we get in the car and we're already a bit angry and a bit frustrated, we're actually more likely to think other people are being aggressive towards us. So it, it perpetuates a little bit too. Uh, and traffic delays is, is also a key source of anger for people and particularly traffic delays that are unexpected, that you know we can't quite work, uh, work around. And this is a good question from Lindy here as well. Um, just asking, sort of draws on this nicely. Like, does any research indicate if any type of driver profession, i.e., taxi, truck, bus, might exhibit more aggressive behaviour? Um. No, not that. Actually, it's a really good question. Um. Not that I, uh, I'm aware of that have specifically looked at um, the types of professions. So we uh, recently, um, using some Australian data, compared sort of anger and aggression across drivers who would drive mainly for work versus drivers who would drive um, mainly for non-work purposes. And we didn't really find a lot of differences between people who drive mainly for work and people who don't, with the exception that work drivers are on the road more. So they have um, more opportunity to sort of be angry and be aggressive. But the relationships between anger and aggression um, we found were very similar. But I don't know if, if people have actually pitted different uh, types of professions against each other. I think that's a, a really interesting question. Um, and I, equally whether some drivers receive more aggression too, I think would be quite, uh, quite a good question. That's an interesting one because we know there's, there's, a, there's aggression between modes because it's like when people are, when I'm a pedestrian, I'm a pedestrian, they think that you change into driving, to cycling, to this. And like cyclists can be quite subject to a lot of aggression um, and sometimes heavy vehicle. But the L platers, I think I reflect back to your anxiety thing. Everyone's an L plater, but, but why does everyone get so impatient around an L plater as well? Yeah, and I think this is, we, um, I did a study uh, many, many moons ago now, and it was a driving simulator study, where we actually um, uh, simulated a, a, a sort of a, an impediment scenario using a, a vehicle um, that had an L-plate on, uh, and the same scenario with a vehicle that didn't have an L-plate on, and we found that our drivers were a little bit more aggressive when they were sort of impeded by a learner driver. Um, and, and that was particularly interesting because as you say, Jerome, like these are the more vulnerable drivers uh, and our behaviours towards them can actually affect, uh, affect their, how they drive subsequently and whether they choose to continue driving too. So, so there is sort of a little bit of research out there to say that we might, um, uh, we might behave differently uh, to, to different types of road users, definitely. But, but within the, I like the, the question about um, the different types of aggression across different professions is, is mm. it's, it's a good one. I'll we'll take that one on night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, so, so as part of our, um, uh, as, as part of the research we did to develop our um, reducing aggressive driving campaign, we we applied this uh, questionnaire to some drivers in Canberra because we wanted to understand what the um, what sort of level of anger these situations elicited. And you can see that danger posed by others here was the most anger provoking situation um, and travel delays were sort of the least anger provoking situation. And, and, and on average drivers sort of reported moderate to higher levels of anger with danger posed by others, but traffic delays, we get relatively low levels of anger. So even though drivers will, will say, oh, you know, this does annoy me, in terms of the level of, of annoyance that drivers feel, um, definitely travel delays is sort of only a really low level of anger. Whereas the danger, uh, understandably, Jerome, as you said, with the fright or flight kind of thing, that's the thing that gets the higher level of anger, um, that danger posed by others. And that's interesting because it aligns with what Brooke just said here. I work with the RYDA program, Road Safety Education for High School Students. They tell us that one of the biggest challenges to the self-control on the roads is from other drivers tailgating at high speed. They find it very hard not to speed as a result. So that would go exactly back to that point around they feel threatened. 
Ab absolutely. And, and, and when we you know, when we look at anxious drivers, that is one of the key worries that, that they have is actually being tailgated. So, so it's a significant problem. And I think perhaps tailgating is a really good example of um, how, it, how drivers can feel that that behavior can change the behavior of another, another person. So it's that sense of control because Normally, when we're aggressive, it's because we feel that um, if we do this, we'll get an outcome we want, um, or we're in control of this this outcome. And I think that's a that's a perfect perfect example. And it, it's it's definitely something that has has longer term consequences for for drivers. So, what can we do about? It? What strategies can we do to to reduce this? I've got a couple of questions asking exactly that. <laughs> that, that's absolutely fantastic. So I'll, I'm going to um, zip across to the next slide. Then. <laughs> um, uh, he, he, how's this? Um, the answer is actually nothing. <laughs> Bizarrely, um, uh, research outside of driving, uh, when they've looked at how do we how do we reduce this anger. Um, actually shows that venting anger very rarely helps reduce the anger. Ruminating very rarely helps. If you can actually focus your attention elsewhere, then you can stop sort of focusing on that situation and then you won't react. Uh, and that's sort of what's underlined this whole travel time is your, your time campaign. Um, and what do you want to do with that time? And, and trying to preserve and protect um, that time for you. And, and not sort of letting anger in and letting anger ruin your day. So how about I flip here, Jerome? Do you want to have a quick uh, chat about the campaign? <laughs> um, and just to point out, like, so on the website, um, under packages, everything's held together. There's a complete organisational road safety package. And I just wanted to acknowledge all the fantastic organisations and people that helped pull this together. So we just acted as a bit of a convener. A man that was our amazing, passionate researcher who dived in and um, budget direct was then kind enough to do a YouGov survey, which, which was designed together. And they really sort of um, magic it up. And then Caitlin and the team from Swinburne University did all the beautiful sort of design work um, around the, the campaign, which you'll see. And it all sits on free on our packages. And we had uh, Tim Roberts as well from Fleet Strategy was kind enough to create the videos to and the goal was to make life as easy as possible. So there's a facilitation pack, but it walks you through what are the steps in a perfect world where you can engage your workers over like a, a several couple of weeks. Because anyway, is, is everyone in the organization at some point will be on the roads. So the idea of these is, is to act, provide an easy to use kit um, so you can age, engage everyone and have a conversation. Because I think it goes back to exactly the point you made um, earlier, Amanda, is if we can engage, have a conversation, make people aware of it. And I think, Rosalie makes a point here, knowledge is power and allows people to be empowered to make changes. So without those sort of bits and pieces, um, and that's the goal of the campaign, to make life as easy as possible for everyone. Yeah, and, and so here's, um, here's some examples uh, of the, just as Jerome said, the amazing graphics that, that, that are on these. And, and these sort of really, all the, the sort of information I've, I've talked about earlier um, is really encapsulated in here. So, so aggression, it's not worth the risk. Um, you know, there's, there's a clear safety risk when, when you drive aggressively, but also there's, there's a less seen risks. Um, you know, things get stuck in your head. It can change the way that you drive. It can change how you enjoy dri driving as well. So it can ruin your day um, and that can have sort of longer term effects as well. Um, and, and bearing in mind as well that a lot of drivers, um, it's hard for us to communicate with other drivers on the road. Um, and, and in some cases, drivers may not be being aggressive. 18% um, of drivers say they are aggressive. Um, the, the rest of drivers may be having a bad day or may be reacting to something, but it, it might not be that they're deliberately trying to um, get in your way or, or you know, um, make you angry and make you aggressive as well. Uh, so that's sort of really underlining the campaign. You don't know what's going on in someone else's headspace. And I think um, as we've come out of lockdown, you've got the pressure of COVID and all those sort of things going on, economic pressures. Um, and as Sonia makes a point here, it's only seven weeks until Christmas. I think we're more susceptible to aggression once they enter a car park. Like there's, there's more of these pressure points in there. What are your thoughts? 
Yeah, and I, I love this. And that's a, it's a really, really great point, Sonia, because it's something that, Jerome, we've discussed as well. Like, what, what's going to happen now that we're all getting back on the roads? Um, you know, and what is our new normal going to look like? And, and, and something Jerome and I talk about is, is how, you know, we've enjoyed the absence of that commute that sort of, uh, you know, hour battle to get into work every day and back again. Um, how can we protect that time and, and sort of preserve that me time that we've found? Um, and what are the roads going to be like? You know, are we all going to be more stressed um, and therefore maybe more aggressive? Or maybe we won't be. Maybe we've, we've all come out of this crazy time and we've all been in it together. So, so maybe we're going to be um, more cohesive on the roads. And I guess that's something, yeah. Jerome, what are your thoughts on that? I know it's going to be quite fascinating. I think um, one of the interesting things is, is pe as people get, especially in Melbourne, as you get back on the road, there's the de-skilling. So people haven't driven for a while. So you're going to have to shake out a few cobwebs and just be cognizant of that. Just be aware of those sort of things. I think it's where that, that mindfulness one coming in, be in the moment where you're driving. Think about what sort of strategies you put in place. The thing I love, I probably, I, I download um, and I have my, my podcast. I listen to them um, and it doesn't bother me how long it takes to work. I probably get to know when I arrive because I haven't quite got if this podcast is at a good point. I try and have strategies like that to um, that way I don't want to be on the no one's going to call me because my phone will be off, all this sort of stuff. And I'm streaming, and that, that's my strategy. Are you all the same, are you? I, I, I do quite I do quite enjoy a good a good <laughs> podcast. Although I sometimes my strategy is my husband will call me um, just to sort of keep me talking during the drive and then we'll have nothing to say to each other. So we'll just be driving in silence. <laughs> That's very mindful of us. <laughs> Well, at least you're comfortable. I think it's, it's, it's a sign of a strong relationship if you come to each other's silence. Is that right? Is that how it goes? Yeah, exactly. It's a long drive too. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that was really all, all, all the slides I had. So I guess I'll bring up the, the question slide. Oh, we, and we've got some great ones here as well. I think um, uh, one here from Duncan, you snuck him through into chat. So Duncan asks, has there been any research lining the big five personality traits like conscientiousness, extroversion, emotional stability, openness, agreeableness and propensity to road rage. Absolutely, Link. yes, yes, there has. Um, uh, off the top of my head, um, I can't quite remember the, the, um, the outcomes of that. And I have to apologise, Duncan, because I've actually done some of this research myself. Um, uh, but what I can do is I can definitely uh, get back to you with that. Um, but there has absolutely been a couple of papers that have looked at that and aggression. And some, but not all, of those are related. So we'll take that. I think that's one we can look at. We'll create a quick fact. We'll explore that. that, that that's an action we can take out of this for NSRP and MEARC to do. Um, then Kat has a great question here. Does the vehicle driver with the influence of alcohol or and drug use, does that lead to more aggressive driving? Uh, that is something we haven't looked at. We haven't looked at the interaction between uh, impairment and aggression. So, so I, I wouldn't be able to answer that one, I don't think. What about fatigue? Do people, are people more sense of fatigue or hunger? Are there certain other things which, which may be a bit more triggered to make people, I think of my daughter, she gets the hangries. I'd hate to see her behind the wheel, but she's only eight. Um, but are there triggers for some people like that as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a big, a big part of that is knowing what your triggers are too. Um, and knowing that when you get in the car, as, as I've said, you know, the, the stresses and the, the emotions, we don't leave them behind. So they come with us. And it's being aware of that, being aware that if we're a bit more stressed, we might be a bit more inclined to take things personally uh, when something happens on the road and maybe to, to want to react aggressively as well. And that can vary. There will be some people who no matter what, they're, they're not going to change their driving style and they've got a, a very good compliance style. And for other people, there might be certain situations that lead them just to, to on that day, react, uh, react aggressively. And that's this very, um, it's a very individual thing too. And it's great to be aware of that. Um, got a, just a comment here from Brooke. A couple of strategies we tap into with students is the focus elsewhere area. Uh, commentary, uh, commentary driving is a great tool for that. Also empathy, understanding that there may be a reason for the other driver's behavior. Um, they might have just picked up a wedding, three tier wedding cake or those sort of things and they're driving slowly. Um, and also great compliment for another person in your campaign. So thank you for that, Brooke. 
Yeah, I think I think that's um, that's absolutely it, isn't it? And often it's easy for us just to assume that someone else's behaviour was intentional. Um, and and one of the campaign slogans that I really like is um, uh, that driver is another person. It's not another driver. It's another person. And I think that really taps into what you're saying there, Brooke, because we're so de depersonalised on the road, we can forget that they're probably having a bad day or they're you know something's going on there, and it might not be be an intentional attack on us absolutely and and that idea of, of focusing your attention elsewhere i think is, is really great and it taps into the the mindfulness um element which i know that there'll be a webinar on that that soon and we've looked at that with uh, anger and aggressive driving and being mindful accepting that you're angry but you're not going to react um not relying on that that idea that they've cut me off they must have done that deliberately because previously someone's done that all of those things can really help us to just just not react to that anger and not let that anger seep in and affect us beyond the drive too. And I'll include a link to the mindfulness webinar on the uh, 17th as well uh, in the, in the follow-up links to the webinar. So um, Rosalie's just got a great, she makes another comment. I also think the maturity of the head will influence your reactions. Um, and it's an important aspect of driving behaviour. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and something that we see a lot in the research too is that um, also the younger drivers do tend to be more aggressive. Um, as, you, as you get older, you tend to sort of uh, at least say that you, you have less aggressive driving behaviours. And a lot of that comes to, to also, um, you start to accept the risk a bit more, I think, when you're older too, and you've been on the road a, a, a bit longer. And this is a great uh, question from uh, Venkat again. In relation to aggressive driving, do driver behaviour changes when attending to phone calls, assuming the hands free, depending on the type of conversation? Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I really like this. I really like this question. Um, we we did some research when I was in uh, Edinburgh. Uh, I was living in Edinburgh for a while, and we actually did some research on couples arguing um, <laughs> in the car and also on the phone. Um, and, and we found that, yeah, and we actually found that when you're having a, a, a conversation on the phone and you're arguing, you are actually quite distracted. Um, but when you're arguing in the car with partner, uh, you also tend to take your eyes off a little bit more too. So, so even in the car, if you're having a heated conversation, it can actually influence your driving. So, and that was a, that was a study we did a few years ago. It was quite interesting. So I think it, it's a good thing to, I guess it's like you're not, never supposed to have an argument in bed, so perhaps maybe the same thing. Don't have an argument in the car. We just pause that. We hold that for later on, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, ab absolutely. <laughs> um, and just drawing a little bit further from a different angle, um, Brooke has a, has a sort of a great question here. Studies have shown that the type of music we, music we can listen to can impact speed and reaction time. Have you seen much of a correlation between music and anger or music as a tool to calm? Uh, yes, um, there are some studies out. Uh, I haven't actually been involved in those, but again, I can I can try to hunt them down, which has looked at, at music in a way to calm down anger. Um, so what I can do is I can actually try to, to find, uh, find that study. I know it, I think it's um, coming out if it's not out um, already that, that have looked at that. And it's definitely, a, again, it's a nice way to refocus your attention somewhere else than, than on the anger uh, and the aggression in the road. So we'll pop that as another action, Jerome. Um, I'll hunt down that paper. That's great. We've got two good actions which we'll follow up with. So thank you, Brooke, and thank you, Duncan, for them. Um, so... Question here from Tim, and we'll probably have time for one or two more after that. Uh, Tim, observation, returning to the roads post lockdown can be surreal. There also appears to be a reluctance to use public transport resulting, resulting in increased congestion stress. Thoughts on specific workplace preparation for that return? Mm, good one. What that are your thoughts, Amanda? Oh, um, that, that is, um, that is a, a really, really good question. I guess I would, I would draw it back to our campaign um, Jerome is to uh, I think if we're a, a lot of the, the situations that we see people becoming angry in a lot of it is uh, unexpected travel delays or um, sort of unexpected events so I guess uh, uh, be prepared that it might be busier um, and and perhaps it might be a little bit more aggressive 
uh, on the roads and we don't know, but, but I, so I guess be prepared uh, and still try to protect your travel time is, is what I would say, uh, using the fantastic resources <laughs> that we've given in the campaign. Um, and I'd say, I don't know, like a great one would be um, allow flexibility. So for organisations, greater flex time and understanding. Don't put pressure on your drivers. Where are you calling up? Those sort of angles as well. Because if someone's calling you and pestering your phone or, or this sort of stuff, that's only going to add to your anxiety and pressure whilst driving. Um, the other one is questioning, do we need to be on the road as much? You and I are doing a webinar now. Um, we're both in the same city. We're not even at Monash. Um, I'll be, be, it would have been... Could have sat opposite each other, but this is the reality now. And it's something we, we actually talked about when we talked about this webinar four or five months ago, Jabrain, we were saying, will we be able to, to sit next to each other? <laughs> and no. <laughs> <That's not the laughs> <answer>. <laughs> and and if it is, we'd have our lovely mask and then this sort of stuff on as 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 well. So I think that's gonna be part of that adaptation that that workers. And um, question here from Lindy. When the participants were asked if they think they are an aggressive driver, what context was it asking? If you ask me that question, I would say that I'm not an aggressive driving driver. However, that does not mean that I never show aggressive driver driver behaviour from time to time. Great question. No, that's a fantastic question. And I think that taps into why I find that that's so interesting. And yet you're absolutely right, uh, Lindy, that the question was, are you an aggressive driver? Um, and so, so it is, uh, and, and we show that 18% of people see themselves an aggressive driver. But as you say, most of us would say, no, I'm not an aggressive driver, but we still have those moments when the circumstances align and we engage in behaviours that, that do increase our risk. That mumbling. And the thing is, a lot of people go, oh, being mumble or the bird or yelling or I like the one where the data came through, pulling faces. So what sort of faces do you pull? Like, What's an angry face? Like, and there's the other car, other car driver is that just internalised. Like I'm, I'm pulling a face at that person over there because I've done something wrong. They will know I've pulled a face at you or I feel better. Is, is, is that the sort of a thinking in the minds? Uh, with, with the pulling faces question? Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I like this example because I always think, and it probably doesn't work so much uh, now we've got social distancing and masks on, but, but I like the example that it's not something we would do in the grocery line or if somebody, you know, I'm not but, but when I'm in the car, you know, that, that's how I respond. Although now we, we have our masks on, who knows <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> I, that, that is really muffled. And I guess the last question here, then we'll be looking at why, a lot of comments, I guess. Uh, Rosalie makes another comment around studies. So please consider a study on impairment or ill health plus aggression. As you mentioned, this has not been done. So good little ideas popped out of that one, I must admit. Absolutely. And that's what, yeah, that's it's what I, it's what's great about this. Um, because the more we can research, the more we can understand and the more we can um, focus on reducing. So I think that's fantastic. Yeah. And one last closing comment from here, Caitlin, she's put in the chat um, saying, I'm a P plater. Uh, she gets quite anxious driving herself because um, a couple of aggressive drivers while she's starting out made her more scared when she gets behind the wheel. So it's a bit of that legacy moment. If you're just starting out, it can, it can really knock about your, your confidence when you get behind the wheel. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's what we find um, with some drivers who experience anxiety over driving. You get a small group of drivers who, who start to learn to drive and then, and then their experiences, particularly interacting with the other, other drivers, just leads them to go, I'm not going to go for my licence. I don't want to go for my licence. And that has really big knock-on effects, um, you know, for them as well. So, so it's something we don't, we don't think about a lot. Yet, yet bizarrely, um, most of us have had an experience where someone's been aggressive to us and it's actually affected us and, and we've thought about it and felt it later. Um, and that happens to other people too. That's fantastic. Well... Amanda, we've just basically come up towards the end. We've done exactly an hour pretty much. So if you just go to the last slide, thank you very much. Here we go. So um, there's Amanda's contact details. There's my contact details. Um, as I mentioned, this will all be put out live. Uh, there'll be a link to the recording and the PowerPoint. And we'll also include that uh, in the follow-up, a link to the, uh, the mind, mindfulness webinar as well. So um, Amanda, thank you so much for basically joining us today and being part of, of of the campaign, sharing your knowledge and your research and, and joining us for, for a chat. 
thanks. It, it's, it's been a lot of fun. I'm sad that it's over. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much to everyone who's dialed in. Uh, these are only as good as the, our participants and the questions they ask as well. So it's very much a joint effort from everyone. Uh, thank you all very much and until next time.